So in doing these sort of talks, um, you never quite know exactly <laughs> where to start and end. You know, you, you don't know what your audience is going to be like. Um, so I'm curious, how many out there have actually tried to uh, integrate a wireless driver, a wireless device? Okay, and how many of you have had to dig deep into the uh, driver code? Okay, so we have a few. Any of you actually have uh, submitted uh, driver code upstream? Great. <laughs> okay. Um, as, as a note, uh, next time you go fix something in the driver, please submit it upstream. <laughs> Calais and the rest of us would be thrilled to get it. Um, so, and then of course the other problem is, of course, 50 minutes. So I'm gonna have to kinda start with a little, you know, some of the background, some of the stuff, because not everybody here is a Wi-Fi driver expert, or Wi-Fi stack, Linux Wi-Fi stack expert, um, and then get to some of the stuff, more advanced stuff for more advanced people. So, um, and trying to do all that in 50 minutes, I apologize how much of the stuff I'm gonna miss, okay? But uh, we'll, we'll get what we can done, so. Um, so ideally this, okay, before I go, I go to that, one little piece of housekeeping. Um, a former employer of mine uh, actually gave me a module to give out to somebody in here. So somebody would like, one of these. It is called a WB50. Uh, well, this is the radio. This is the dev kit. Um, and basically, it is a full Linux computer, a little, little uh, uh, SOM, um, that uses A6K radio. Okay. And so I'm going to be raff essentially raffling one of those off. So I will start the box around. Pass that around, and somewhere in the last like minute or two of the of the talk, I'll go ahead and, and raffle that off. Okay, so <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and do an overview of the basic concepts because you can't really talk about debugging, doing interfacing, that sort of stuff until you've got at least a basic idea of what's there. We'll talk about interfacing devices. Um, things like this, um, and then we'll go through the debugging tools, how to get help, that sort of stuff. Okay, why am I the person up here speaking to you instead of one of you guys up here? Um, now, there's probably other people here who has similar experiences. Uh, I've been working in Linux Wi-Fi for the last 10 years or so. Um, I've been working with embedded Linux for 17, um, and I've contributed across a wide I'm, I'm a, more of a generalist, okay? I've contributed across a wide variety of open source projects. Um, but over the last several years, it's been, most of my participation has been focused in Linux Wi-Fi. Uh, but at the same time, it's been across a lot of the different drivers. The last few years has been pretty heavily with ASICs KL. Uh, before that, uh, Libertus, Libertus, thin firmware. Um, and, and I've do, done a few of the other drivers too here and there. So. Um, and uh, obviously, as I said, I used to work for Laird. Um, the software in this is mostly mine <laughs> in some form or manner. Uh, so I have unusual special knowledge of their platform specifically. So anyway, on to the bread and butter here. Okay, let's talk about Wi-Fi chips. Not that you can see it real well, but this, on this device, this uh, one covered by the, the can and the sticker, that's the actual Wi-Fi SIP on here. Everything else is you know, processor, RAM, and all that. They come in, obviously, all sorts of different sizes and shapes and capabilities. Um, but fundamentally, they fall into two basic categories, um, at least as far as the Linux kernel is concerned. Uh, you've got your full Mac chips and your soft Mac chips. You might hear soft Mac talked about as half Mac or thin Mac, but fundamentally your difference is 
it's, it's where the upper level, the ML, MLME layer resides. Does it reside on the chip, either in the hardware itself or in the firmware running on the hardware, mo more likely? Um, or is it residing up in Linux's Mac at O2 la layer? Um, and so that's, at least when it comes down to Linux, that is really what it comes down to is in determining whether you got a full or a soft Mac chip. Um, even, of course, in soft Mac chips, you've got a fairly wide variety of offloading to the hardware. <laughs> so there are stuff that sometimes you, you know, some chips do up in the Mac layer, the Mac editor 2 layer, uh, that other chips actually will go ahead and, and offload onto the chips themselves. Um, but in any case, uh, that, that's your fundamental difference. Or that, that's how I categorize it. Does it use Mac 802.11? Mac 802.11? Then that's a soft Mac chip. Period. That, that's kind of how I, I do it. Okay. Nearly every one of these chips, I'm sure you've seen these, uh, have firmware blobs. I'm only aware of I think two chips where that firmware is open source. Okay. Every other one is a closed source blob provided to you, hopefully by the vendor, <laughs> somewhere along the line. Um, with a little luck, it is upstreamed into uh, the Linux firmware project uh, and automatically will come with your distribution. Um, if you're unlucky, it's a newer chip and you get that firmware blob when you're integrating directly from uh, Qualcomm or Broadcom or Marvell or so on and so forth, right? Um, and may or may not have other bugs. <laughs> Just like everything else, um, all of these have their own little errors and quirks and problems. Uh, and guess what? You guys know how this works, right? Closed source firmware, you just have to live with it if it's got a bug, right? You gotta work around it, you've gotta figure out uh, what you gotta do in order to live with it um, and make up for that problem you, because you can't fix it. Uh, if you're really, really lucky and you work for a company that has enough pull, you might be able to get firmware source out of your vendor. Good luck. <laughs> There's a few. <laughs> it happens sometimes. We were able to do that uh, at Laird. Um, but uh, it's, it's very, very rare and takes a lot of uh, negotiating power to do that. So um, now, something you need to know about firmware. So if, if you go and you're, you write a driver from scratch, not that any of you are going to do that or not going to want to do that, um, but let's say you do, you're going to want to load that firmware blob as late as possible. Okay? Uh, and so you'll see a wide variety of loading strategies throughout the, um, the Wi-Fi drivers. Um, some will load it right on during probe. Uh, that is generally not, I won't say it's not allowed, it's generally not recommended. Um, the problem is when you have things that depend on external firm firmwares that are sitting off in a file system somewhere and you compile that into the kernel and on <laughs> kernel bring up, you can't get access to that file, you, you got a little problem there. So, and so as much as possible, um, the driver maintainers try to load firmwares as late as possible in, in the system. There's all sorts of strategies. It's a mess, um, despite a lot of really great people working on it, working really hard, actually. Um, it always seems to trip, trip things up when you're, when you're going through this stuff. Um, believe it or not, there's a whole class of problems caused by uh, the, the, the firmware loading times and things like that. So, anyway. Okay, so that brings us on to the firmware. Okay, nearly, all of the chips, as I said, they've got to load that firmware. Um, even those soft Mac chips in general load firmware, okay? They'll load a thin firmware. Has the lower level capabilities of the chip and uh, then it will pass all of the messages. So all of the, uh, all the Mac messages, the beacons and all that sort of stuff will go on up to Linux and, to be processed. Your full Mac chip, a lot of things like the beacons and stuff like that that they receive, they process that internally. But your thin Mac chips will pass all that up. Um, as I mentioned, lib firmware, uh, that's where most of those blobs are residing. And um, the and Linux firmware 
git. Okay. Interfaces. As far as I'm aware, nearly every conceivable interface that is out there <coughs> is used somewhere on some Wi-Fi chip or other. <laughs> okay. Um, I've seen everything from uh, uh, from, from Spy to UARTs, believe it or not. Um, but majority of them, of course, use SDIO, USB, or PCIe, okay? Um, some of the drivers can actually use multiple hardware interfaces. For example, the A6K chip on the device I keep pulling out as an example uh, can do, thank you, can do either USB or SDIO. Um, as configured on this particular board, it uses SDIO. Uh, they have other, other people use the chip in a USB mode. Um, and so the A6KL driver, to continue with the example, has both of those interfaces represented in the driver, okay? Um, just depends which chip you're using. Now, they don't use, you don't write the whole hardware bus access, of course, because you use the SDIO layer. You know, the MMC layer in the kernel if, if your chip is SDIO. You use the USB layer. You use whatever, whatever the bus layer, uh, you know, the underlying bus drivers in Linux kernel, those are the ones that you are going to go ahead and use. Um, and so your driver will plug into those, utilize those, and, um, and, and work with those. Um, you don't have to write that from scratch. Now, there is almost always, on top of whatever, whatever the hardware bus is, there, of course, is always some sort of messaging bus on top of all that, right? That the higher level messaging bus. Um, A6KL um, is called HIF. Um, other ones use other things. Um, but basically, it's how the chip packages things up. Um, to send them up to the upper layer where they get unpacked so they can actually, so your driver can do what it needs to. And whether that is command messages or whether that is the actual packets coming back and forth, uh, pretty much every driver has some sort of wrapper format for those messages going back and forth, okay? Um, and that is in your driver somewhere, but that, driver, but that will go ahead and use the lower level bus driver. Um, okay. Now, any particular chip or SIP or whatever format it comes in, of course, is going to have other pins, right? Um, as you can see, this is you know, obviously a piece of a schematic. Um, and as you can see, there's other random pins here. Um, some of them are obvious, you know, like over there on the, on the right-hand side, you've got the, the uh, SDIO pins. Um, I won't count those as other pins. But if you look on the left side, you'll see a Wi-Fi chip PWDL pin. Um, I'll explain that one later. You can see a Wacom wireless pin, uh, which on most processors would get wired into a GPIO somewhere, um, possibly an interrupt. Um, down here on the bottom, you can see some Bluetooth pins. Um, those are utilized for uh, uh, Bluetooth coexistence, for example. Um, and so you've got other pins that you got to worry about, uh, need to connect those up, um, depending on what you're doing, right? Uh, your driver that you have may or may not utilize some of those pins. <laughs> For example, um, the Wi-Fi chip uh, PWD underscore L pin over there, that is a power pin, kind of. It's a... It, it's a, it's a control pin for, a, for internal regulators on the chip. Some drivers will drive that directly. Um, I tried, in fact, I tried to upstream a patch that never got accepted that actually handles that pin. Um, many systems utilize the regulator subsystem actually to handle those pins, um, even though in some cases they aren't really regulators, but um, they kind of work that way, so it works. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Bluetooth coexistence. This is a pain. Primarily because most of the people who work on Bluetooth and most of the people who work on Wi-Fi are not necessarily the same people. Um, and there's Bluetooth 
chips, and there's Wi-Fi chips, and there's Bluetooth plus Wi-Fi chips. Um, and so this, this is one of those things that if you want to work right, you're going to have to spend a little bit of time and effort to get working. Um, I've yet to see it work out. Of, it probably works out of the box on some chip. I don't know. But I've never seen it work out of the box properly on any chip I've worked on. Um, in most cases, it's a pain in the butt. Um, so anyway, as I said, uh, integrated. Um, many of the Bluetooth, especially the older ones, will have separate UART pins. That's, so it's essentially like having two chips on one chip, OK? Um, and the Bluetooths are completely separate in many cases. Um, sometimes you end up with, with chips that are uh, both the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are going over the SDIO. Sometimes they are split off on USB and SDIO. It, again, I've seen just about every configuration. Um, sometimes the coexistent stuff is routed internally and you never have to worry about or see that. Uh, other times, they have separate pins, as you saw earlier. Um, as I said, uh, it always needs setup. Always needs setup. So um, you're just going to have to deal with that. So, OK. I imagine most of you have seen a diagram similar to this somewhere on the internet what one time or other. Um, this is my interpretation of the Linux Wi-Fi stack. And uh, get a good look at it. I won't be flipping back and forth. Despite as I go through, I'll be describing it. Uh, your hardware is down there at the bottom. User space is up at the top. Um, kernel is the, obviously the largest blob in the, in the center there. Um, most of what we're going to be talking about, of course, will concentrate there in the center. Um, that's where what we're really worried about or, um, when we're talking about um, debugging the integration. Uh, but that's basically what it looks like. So let's go ahead and start at the low level. We've already talked about this, right? We've got full and soft Mac chips. We've got um, a particular bus interface. I'm not going to go any further into that. So your next level up, of course, is your bus driver. Okay? I mentioned it uses your standard Linux bus driver. So MMC, the USB subsystem, uh, PCIe, I recently worked on a PCIe chip. Uh, and as I said, I've seen other weird ones. Uh, some of the really, really low speed chips, I've seen spy ones, I've seen, seen one on a UART. Um, in fact, I think actually Microchip makes one that has a UART interface. And I believe there's a driver in there somewhere for that. So anyway, um, OK. Now, now the stuff that we haven't really talked about yet. So now we get up to the Wi-Fi device driver layout. There is a, it doesn't matter whether you got a full Mac that doesn't use Mac 2.11 or a half Mac, soft Mac chip that doesn't use Mac 2.11. Uh, sorry, said that backwards. Uh, Either way, you still have a driver for the device, right? Um, that's at the, at the bare minimum. It will utilize the SDIO driver. We'll, we'll use the SDIO, for example. It'll utilize the SDIO driver um, to get stuff physically to and from the chip. Then it will have some sort of abstraction layer in order to um, unpack, repack up, or unpack the messages um, that it needs to do and then it will do whatever it needs to do. In the case of a full Mac chip, pretty much everything needs to be done will be done at that layer. Um, and so all the packages will get processed as necessary uh, and then passed up to user space at some point, okay? In a Mac Editor 211, a soft Mac, uh, it will pretty much immediately send all that stuff up to Mac Editor 11, where most of the processing will actually be handled, OK? So Mac Editor 211, um, if you're ever trying to figure out what kind of driver you are looking at, the easiest way to do is look for IEEE Editor 211 underscore something. Uh, ops, Alec Hardware, and Register Hardware, 
those are used right there when the driver sets it up and connects it all together, okay? So the, those, are, those are your initialization functions. That is your key. If you see that in a driver, you're working with a soft Mac uh, chip, um, and that is important later, especially when you're trying to figure out why this does not work, okay, <laughs> when you're having trouble. All right, above, above Mac 802.11 or above your full Mac driver, then you have config 802.11. This is your main configuration API and stands basically between user space and your driver, okay? Um, all of the things that are done go through this API it's in some form or manner. So what, things like asking for scans, um, setting a uh, regulatory domain, um, setting up connections, things like that, uh, Rates, rates are there. Um, just throwing out a few examples. Uh, those are all right there in the Configure 211, um, and all the drivers, soft or full Mac, will use that. Some of you, I don't know, does anyone here remember wireless extensions? <laughs> a few of you, okay. Um, so Configure 211 and NLA 211 replaced wireless extensions, basically, okay. Um, there might be a handful of drivers using wireless extensions, at least in some compatibility layer somewhere in there. Um, but pretty much as far as I'm aware, everything has moved over to Config 802.11 and NLA 802.11. Um, so NL 802.11 is a NetLeak interface. Uh, you no longer use uh, Octals. Now you're using the NetLeak socket interface. Um, and this is how you work with Config 11 and the rest of the wireless stack. This is how you tell it to do things, okay? Um, this is the management interface. Uh, and then that, of course, is not the, well, we'll get to data here in a minute, but, um, okay, so, and then up in user space, so we'll, we'll, we'll stick on the management side for a second. Your basic tools, IW, for example, uses NL802.11, to talk to Config 802.11 to either tell the driver or Mac 802.11 what to do. Okay. That's basically how the flow of commands work, and then of course the information comes back up over the same sort of thing. Um, for those, anybody here st still using IW Config? Please don't do that anymore. <laughs> Unless you're on an ancient kernel, of course. Um, so uh, IW config, IW priv, um, actually I still use it, but I have config, I'm sure we're all using that, um, have all been deprecated a long, long time ago. Um, and in some modern systems, a lot of those won't even work anymore. Uh, IW is the way to do it nowadays. Um, and if you need to pro, <laughs> there's a big warning in IW, I don't know if you guys have seen it, don't screen scrape this tool. There's a big warning there. Um, because they want you, if you're programmatically controlling the network stuff, to of course use native programs and use uh, the Netlink layer. Um, but I'm sure all of you, just like I do, still script around IW's input and output. But I will tell you, uh, that leads to breakage. Sometimes that uh, what IW prints will change periodically. So um, be careful <laughs> when doing that. Uh, we're all, I hope, I hope we are familiar with WPA Supplicant. Um, very, very large project. Uh, obviously, there's also host APD, uh, goes along with that same project. Um, and so, for those that aren't aware, WPA Supplicant handles the encryption stuff. So, handles the WPA2 um, and all of the other encryption protocols, okay? That's not handled directly down in the kernel. Though there's a few, there are a few chips that do offload some of that into their, uh, into their firmware. Um, and the stack is actually capable of doing that if the drivers and everything are set up correctly to do it. Um, and then of course you've got the higher level tools, uh, Network Manager, who I love to hate, um, Conman, uh, there's other tools like that. But you know, th th those are there to manage connections regardless what kind of connection is, okay? Obviously, Network Manager happily manage Ethernet connections just as well as your, uh, as well as your wireless connections. 
Okay, so that's on the management space. Now we have the data side. Okay, I'm sure you guys know this, but I'll throw it out there. From the data side, there is no difference. But once you're up in, in user space, there's no difference between talking to an Ethernet or a wireless device. It just you're, you're opening a socket, you're doing standard system calls. Um, and so all of that goes through the TCIP stack or the, UDP or the UDP stuff. Whatever it is you're trying to do is exactly the same regardless what interface you're working on. Um, obviously the management side's a little bit different, but the data side is the same. Now that has some interesting, when you go look in the driver, that has, the, the one little interesting little bit of that is obviously you've got two parallel routes for data in the very broad sense going through the driver down the chip, okay? Um, because you actually have the data packets, you've got a route for that, but you also then have another route for the command, the configuration stuff, right? Um, you know, so you do something with IW, it sends something down that link, um, that gets down in your driver. Uh, again, we'll use SXKL as an example. Uh, it, it figures something out, and then it sends what's called a WMI command down to the chip, um, which, at which point, kind of the, that's kind of where the data path and the command path kind of merge, because now we're just sending you know, stuff over the bus. Um, and so you've got two parallel things there. The data path, it's all SKBs, it's all just what you would expect going on up to the network path, okay? Um, so, okay. Interfacing. Obviously, that's a wide variety of different uh, devices. There's some PCI devices there, um, USB dongled, all sorts of things. Um, these, this is just, this is probably about a quarter of the devices that happen to be sitting on my desk when um, I was preparing this thing. And uh, yeah, anyway. Okay, so. We're all here to talk about how to de debug in interfacing a new device. So, you have a new device. You just bought it, or your customer came to you and says, I wanna use this on my weird board, or whatever, or, or maybe your hardware designer you're working with that says, ooh, this chip looks cheap, let's use that. And so, eventually you get your hands on it, you plug it in, and the bus, it will identify itself on the bus, hopefully, if it's that type of bus. Um, and so it will have a vendor ID and a device ID that will get shoved out somewhere. Okay. Now, if you're working on a full Ubuntu system, it's, or you know, other similar distribution, would insert your distribution of choice, right? Um, and let's just say it's a USB chip because that's easy to talk about. So you plug it in, it identifies itself, it's something that's already known, and Hot plug gets involved, loads the driver, poof, you're working. That's all nice and easy. Okay, well, what if it doesn't, right? Um, so what are you gonna have to do? First thing you're gonna have to do is figure out what that device is. Um, hopefully by looking at it, by knowing what you plugged in, you know which bus you're looking at, right? You, you know if it's a PCIe or it's a USB or an SCI, I, I would hope. Um, if you don't, I guess start guessing. Uh, odds are it probably was announced somewhere in dmessage. So you can go look at the kernel log and hopefully something spit out. Um, or of course you can reach directly for LSUSB, LSPCI, um, or in the case of if anybody knows an SDIO tool that does the same thing, let me know. But in the case of SDIO, I go look in SysFS um, and I can go find the identifications, okay? Um, so as I said, the three most common devices you're gonna encounter, are, or the three most buses you're gonna encounter are gonna be one of these three, okay? Um, so you do that, and then you gotta go ahead and, and take a look and try to match that with a driver. So good old grep or C-scope or whatever your tool of your choice is, um, this is a little, uh, tiny chunk of code actually out of A6KL. And nearly every, every Wi-Fi chip, 
driver is going to have a chunk of code somewhere like this that identifies those particular um, device and vendor IDs, okay, that match it to this. Um, and so you can go through. Obviously, they're rarely written out in a nice, convenient format. Um, so I'm looking for uh, a 271-301, uh, okay? Well, 271, that's a vendor ID, and, but as you can see, if you go down and look at the second chunk there, you're not gonna find 301. Um, and so it might take a little bit of grepping and then reading some code. Odds, hopefully you know what, who your, the physical vendor is, um, and so that will give you a shortcut of where you're trying to go, but um, you can always go grepping for that. Okay, so you plug it in, and let's say it does know what driver it is, or you already have the driver loaded or whatever. Um, and you'll probably see a trace like this um, in your D message, right? Uh, believe it or not, despite the error message, this is a device that works perfectly, okay? So this is one of those uh, little things about firmware. Uh, the firmware loader system will throw out error messages that aren't really error messages, okay? <laughs> um, so any particular device, uh, you, and again, using S6KL as the example, may have a whole bunch of different firmwares it can load. And so in our particular case, uh, this first looks for firmware-5. I won't read the whole path, but you can see right there. It first tries firmware.5, it can't find that, and the firmware loader will go ahead and spit out an error. And then it will try firmware-4. In this particular case, it found firmware-4, and on it goes. And, and it tells you, uh, again, in the case of this particular driver, it, it tells you the capabilities of what the firmware supports, which is kind of nice. Uh, not all drivers do that. Some drivers will print it out incorrectly. Um, it all just kind of depends. Uh, but, you know, so that's... So this actually is a good result um, in, in this particular case. This is, actually comes out of this chip. Um, okay, so bad result. The first one and the second one is the age old, uh, you know, is it plugged in and powered up, right? Apply, first debugging step for everything, right? Um, now, it's a little bit trickier when you're trying to integrate a piece of hardware you've never seen before to determine necessarily, is it powered? Um, if you're really lucky like me, you have schematics and you can find a, uh, some, some point on it somewhere that you can probe and, uh, with your oscilloscope and, uh, or logic analyzer, you can tell if it's powered, you can tell if it's talking on the bus, that sort of thing. Um, hopefully you don't need to, you know, Obviously, I'm not reaching for the logic analyzer first, but <laughs> you know, you go through the basic checks. Okay, um, in the particular case of the example chip that I keep pointing to, uh, one thing I'm always checking is, is that uh, chip PWD L pin, is that toggled correctly, okay? Because if that is held low, the thing is in reset, nothing's gonna happen, that pin is high, it will live on the bus and talk and communicate, okay? All right, so does it announce on the bus? There's a number of ways to go and look on this. We all already looked at one thing, right? So something's partially working if you can do an LSPCI and you see that the device is there, but you can't do other things. Okay, well, at least you know, at least you know that the system can see the physical device, right? The next part is probably, in many cases, where you're stuck. Okay, if, if you're talking about a dead chip, this is probably your next place. Does it fail to load the firmware? Or more accurately, does it fail to find the firmware? So if you're talking about a new device, you're talking, you probably might not have the firmware. Um, or you might not have it in the right spot. Or you might not have it in the right name. Uh, the names for the firmwares are generally hard-coded into the device driver, okay? Um, common trick, of course, is uh, what I always do. I get a new firmware from the vendor, I name it 
whatever I want to name it, usually with the version number in the file name so I can recognize it, and then I create a symlink that is the name the driver wants to the actual file that I want. Okay, that works, it works beautifully, um, and lets you keep track of what version file you have as well as satisfying the driver problem, okay? Um, okay, so, it didn't, so, so it failed, it, it actually found a firmware, it loaded it. Keep in mind, some of these things require multiple blobs. Uh, blob number one is the actual firmware. Blob number two is often a, uh, a board file, okay? They come by, or a calibration, or there's a number of names, depends on your vendor. Um, and this will include the antenna power adjustments and things like that that are needed to keep your device in regulatory compliance, okay? Or it's part of the equation anyway. Um, and so some of those, and we'll get into some of those details later, but um, some systems, you gotta have that file, okay? All right, so Kate, yes. Um, so, in the case of my example chip, um, the drivers are always, or excuse me, the, so the, let me go back to that one. Okay. So, you see where it says firmware-5, okay? And then you'll see it actually loaded, at the very end of that version number, you'll see API 4. Um, at least in the case of A6KL, and actually most Qualcomm chips, there is some internal version numbers and there's API levels. Um, Qualcomm has been nice enough to call the file name to include the API level. Odds are, <laughs> if the API level matches, it's something that it recognizes, it will work to some degree or other, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Unless, of course, you have special stuff, okay? Um, example of that is at Laird, uh, they do have firmware access, they do put special sauce in the firmware, and they do put special stuff in the driver to work with the special stuff that they put in the firmware. Okay, so there, there's things like that. Um, and then the other, the final thing you can do for compati compatibility-wise, um, as I said, a lot of the firmwares will print out what they support. Um, so they'll have a set of flags, and the driver will be able to look at those flags and, get, and turn on and off different features, okay? So you might be able to look at the driver and go, okay, it doesn't have the ability to do this feature. The firmware I have says it can do this, and now you know you've got a mismatch. Now that just maybe because nobody coded, put that feature in the driver yet, okay? Um, so that, that's an example. Or sometimes it'll sp spit out a firmware flag that the driver has no idea what it is, and it'll just, spit out a, a number and it's like, yeah, now you know the, the firmware supports something the driver doesn't know about yet. So, I hope that answered your question, but <laughs> it's a complicated one. Okay, so we go through, next you wanna see, does it come up? You know, and here I am doing exactly what I told you not to, I'm using IF config, sorry. Um, one of these days I'll learn uh, IP route two commands. Uh, Okay, first test to always do, and I don't, it boggles me, but a lot of people skip this. Don't connect to a WPA2 uh, AP right off the bat. Connect to an open AP. So maybe that means you need to drive over to Best Buy or Fry's or somewhere and pick up an AP and, and uh, configure it as a pure open AP. Call it test foo, whatever you want. Make sure it doesn't connect to anything you care about because everybody in the role could, in theory, get on it. Um, and then try to connect your device to it. If you can connect, connect to an open AP, you're, you're probably doing pretty good at this point, okay? Your, your device is probably working for the most part and you can worry about the upper layer stuff later. Um, but if you can't even connect to an open AP, you know you've got a serious problem, okay? All right. And then, of course, obviously, as you're, as you're going through, uh, you wanna check the features you care about. Do you care about Wi-Fi Direct? Do you care about WPA2? Do you care about whatever? Whatever it is, feature, um, you know, does it do 802.11R? 
I don't know, whatever it is that you want to, you know, go through and test that, right? First thing I always do on my testing systems is I uninstall Network Manager. As it tries to manage your device, it will screw you up, okay? And I, whether it's Network Manager or ConMan or whatever you're using in your device, get rid of it first and then figure things out because I will guarantee you it will go off and try to connect to something that you don't want it to connect to. You'll run a test, you think everything is, you know, everything actually is fine, but because Network Manager tried to do something wonky with it, you, your test fails and it's all, it's all over with, okay? Um, I'm not saying Network Manager is bad, I, it's not, um, and I'm not saying it's a problem, but it is a problem when you're trying to debug the lower layer stuff, okay? It's something that just gets in your way and gets a little confusing. Okay. I found this on a fortune cookie the other day, and I happened to like it, so I stuck it in there. Um, but what it really comes down to is as you're going through and debugging, as you're figuring stuff out, I don't know a single time when I haven't been having a problem that coming up the solution was not pure guesswork at some point. At some point it was, I'm working down really, really hard, and then all of a sudden the light bulb goes on and I go, oh, I should check that, okay? So when that light bulb goes on and you should check that, make sure you go check that, please, <laughs> okay? That's the first thing you should go look. All right, there's a ton of debugging tools already available to you. This list is probably, I, I hope, you recognize everything on this list. If there's one item on this list that is, was not obvious to you, uh, then sitting here for an hour listening to me speak, I hope was worth it. Um, so here's a whole bunch of possible options. So, kconfig. Most of the debugging uh, facilities of most of the wireless stuff is off by default. Turn them on, okay? A6KL, of course, has uh, debug, uh, most of its print Ks are turned off unless you turn that on. Uh, it also can use the tracing system. Um, Broadcom firm, full Mac driver, same deal. Turn on config underscore Broadcom debug, okay? So, turn those on, even if you don't turn those on, there'll be a lot of stuff in dmessage. Um, but if you do turn them on, there'll be a lot more stuff put on there. That said, almost all of them that have this functionality have a debug mask somewhere in there. Okay, A6KL has a very verbose set of debug messages. If you wanna look at all the raw data going to and from the SDIO bus, you can turn that on. Surprise, it's turned off by default because you'll get a flood and it's impossible to read through. Okay, but Whatever you're doing, maybe you're notice particular command's not working. You turn on WMI uh, debug, and you can, you can take a look at the command processing, uh, the config layer. All those usually have individual flags. They're all documented, of course, in the code. Um, in some case, in some wikis, they're documented. Uh, but it's usually a case of uh, giving a particular uh, mask to a either module parameter or in this case, of course, ASIC scales module parameters are, can be changed directly on the command line uh, in, in sys, but, um, so they all have this. Same deal, Broadcom full Mac has this. Um, okay, so module parameters, there's a whole bunch of sets. Um, so for the Broadcom full Mac driver, I gave you a couple Couple, you know, a couple things, uh, debug, this is what we we're just talking about, right? It's the exact same thing. Um, you can actually, on this particular driver, you can override feature de uh, detection. So a particular feature is screwing everything up and causing it to crash. You can disable that when you load the driver, okay? Um, you can even ignore, in, on this particular driver, you can even ignore if the probe fails and just keep going, um, which can be handy. Dangerous, but handy. Okay. SysFS, you guys probably already know this. You can walk the SysFS, you know, you, the, walk the device tree, figure out what's where, okay? Um, sometimes important to do. DebugFS, go look at DebugFS. Enable that, mount that, go look. Um, 
because there's probably a whole bunch of super useful stuff there, okay? I'm not gonna just read the slide to you, so. Uh, some systems will be able to do a core dump of the firmware. Uh, I know ASICKL can do that. I know uh, Broadcom FullMAT can do that. There's other ones that can do that. Um, you can even, in some cases, trigger a firmware crash, if you know what you're doing, uh, and have it do a, a core dump. Kind of handy. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> okay. Um, who here knows about F-Trace? Please? Okay, good. F-Trace is awesome. When you are trying to figure out why something doesn't work, instead of littering it with print Ks just to go through the driver flow, you give the right parameters and you can actually figure out how that driver does its thing, okay? Um, brilliant, brilliant tool, I love it. Um, this is Kernel Shark, this is just a GUI into the F-Trace stuff. Um, take your pick, however you like to do stuff. Um, and then of course, Wireshark. So, everything's working, but something's not working, right? So everything appears to work. Ultimately, it comes down to, does the packet make it to the air? Does it get to the AP? Does the stuff from the AP get back to your device? Fundamentally, that's what it comes down to. That's what Wireshark is for. I'm not gonna teach you how to use Wireshark, I don't have time, but um, there's lots of you know, videos and documentation on how to use Wireshark, okay? All right, common problems, and I apologize, I am running out of time, so I will blaze through this, we're almost done. Um, Bluetooth coexistence often is a common problem. Uh, if you notice wide, things are, are going along just fine, and all of a sudden your connection goes kablooey when it comes to latency or throughput, and then comes back and then dies again for a little while, comes back. It's not actually dropping or anything, it's just you're getting really inconsistent results. I find oftentimes it's actually Bluetooth coexistence. Um, a lot of these devices have shared antennas with the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi. So they use the same frequency domains, they can use the same physical antennas, and so some of them, to save money, will share antennas. Um, and so as you might imagine, if you're using, if both devices are trying to use the antenna at the same time, you're gonna have a problem. Okay, power pins. Sometimes they even have, and I'm not talking about power pins, I'm talking about those regulator control switch on, switch off pins, not just talking about pure power. You gotta make sure those things are set up correctly, um, turned on, turned off at the appropriate times. Uh, sometimes the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi have separate power pins, and sometimes they interact in odd ways. So you have to be careful of that. Uh, correct firmware, I've talked a lot about the firmware, but you gotta find the right firmware, it's gotta be named correctly, you gotta have the right board file, um, otherwise you're gonna have problems. Uh, a common problem you're gonna encounter, though, is multiple drivers. Some of these trip, chips are controlled by multiple drivers. Sometimes those are vendor drivers that conflict with the mainline driver. Uh, there's the term open source vendor driver, which is an odd one, but uh, there's some out there that have a driver out of GitHub, it's never been mainline, but it's still at heart a vendor driver somewhere. Um, sometimes there's even a driver in the mainline and in staging at the same time. So you actually have both on your system. Um, so you gotta watch out for that, use the right driver. Uh, there's also a, a good situation sometimes where there's multiple drivers, because there might be a thin Mac driver and a full Mac driver for the same chip. Now that comes down to make sure you have the right firmware for what you're trying to do, okay? Um, and if you're wondering why you would do that, it's because some of the full Mac chips might not support AP mode, and so some people have created thin Mac firmware in order to use Mac Editor 11, host APD and all that properly, okay? Um, sometimes the tools that, that you're using, i.e. IWconfig, is not gonna interact, if you do stuff in IWconfig and IW at the same time, don't expect good things to happen, okay? Um, in fact, just drop IWconfig, please. Okay. Uh, here's, here's a problem that's actually getting some, uh, some email on the, on the list in the last week or so. 
we have a couple chip vendors that have ended up using the same vendor and device ID on the SDIO bus. This was caused by uh, some SDIO I, uh, IP going out there and the people implementing the at the end not realizing they need to change those things to theirs. Uh, that causes problems, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because then you have to two totally different devices where and multiple drivers that think they both control those devices. It's, it's a mess. Um, regulatory. This is a problem. If any of you have tried to do regulatory stuff, particularly here in, in the United States, um, Europe, um, this, is, this is a big pain. Um, so there's, there's a system called CRDA. Uh, which of course you would use, that is used to, to work with this. Um, another problem with this is some devices do their power levels and stuff. Uh, they might have an EEPROM instead of you loading a board file. Uh, there's all sorts of ways to trip up on this. So if you got something, it's kind of working, but the power, you know, it works if it's this close to the AP, but doesn't work when it's that, you know, the AP's over there you probably have a problem with your power levels, okay? Um, and that's all in the regulatory stuff. And then performance. When somebody comes to you and says, it doesn't work as well as I want or as fast as I want, the first thing you need to do is figure out what they're talking about as far as performance goes. Does it mean it's not connecting at the rates that it's supposed to be connecting to? Or is throughput lower than you think it should be? Um, there's a zillion different reasons that performance might not actually be a performance problem, um, but you, you gotta figure out what that is. Uh, obviously, my gold standard of figuring out what the actual performance is, regardless of anything else, um, is using iPerf, okay? Figure out what the actual throughput is. Once you got that, at least you got some basis of having some numbers to talk about, right? Um, Okay, what is our end time? Is it 3.20 or is it 3.30? Does anybody know? I think it's 3.20. So I'm over and I apologize. Um, and why does it keep doing this? I should disable that. Okay, so just like two more slides. Okay, getting help from, so if you email the Linux wireless list and you say it doesn't work, we're not gonna like that. Give me details, show me what, what doesn't work, okay? Um, enable those debugging features. Give me the kernel logs with the debugging features turned on. Do not be surprised if I or another maintainer say, here, feed this number to the debug parameter and then give us your debug logs. We'll probably do that. Um, be very specific about the hardware, the device, the firmware version, what Linux version you're running on. If you tell me you're running on Linux version 3.8, I'm probably not gonna wanna help you very much, okay? But if you're running something reasonably recent, um, we're certainly happy to, well, I'm, actually I'm happy to help with any version, but um, you know, but if you say it does this, and later I go, well, I can't replicate that, and later you tell me you're on 2.6.33, I go, oh, well, yes, of course you're having that problem. Okay, um, so I need to know what Linux version you've got. Um, be specific about what works and, and, and doesn't work. You know, if it does not work when doing this particular encryption protocol, I need to know that. Don't just be, you know, you know and I go and I connect it to an open AP and it works just fine. I, you know, I'm not finding your problem. Um, and in certain cases, don't be shocked if you're asked to include wireless captures. We don't do that too often because not everybody knows how to use Wireshark. But um, if you know how to do that and can do that, please do. It's actually very helpful to us. Okay, getting help. A um, whole bunch of links. This is mainly so when you download the slides, you have the links. I'm sure these are all obvious to everybody. Um, and then that's it. So thank you very much. Um, if Anybody has questions, uh, please feel free to, to ask me. Um, but I believe we are officially out of time. And I think somebody probably has this room after me, so. Yeah.